Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode number nine, HTML and CSS. Take it away, Jason. Hey, so it's been a, been a little bit of a delay since the last show, but we were both really busy doing some uh, pretty awesome stuff. I went to a conference, the Gecko Conference in Ireland. That tops my excuse of doing random chores around the house, but okay, <laughs> fine, be a show well, I off. Think, I think you had a house house catastrophe to attend to which is oh yeah i just had a little bit of water stuff on my wall get to learn how to fix it yeah. not just a nerd but uh a little did bit you of use a like instructables or anything like that or do you just have natural yeah i just like... google like how to fix water damage on your wall oh yeah this goes back to our talk a couple episodes again you probably yeah. used youtube and saw yeah, somebody yeah, else exactly like, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so it's it was pretty it's actually fairly straightforward it's just hard to match the texture because have all this industrial equipment they use when they do it initially and then it's really hard to make it look like that again. Yeah, like because when they when they paint your walls, they like spray, and so blotches show up. But when yeah. you use a brush, it's like you get streaks instead. Or it's like so smooth, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyways, yeah, boring. Okay, Ireland. <laughs> so so, so yeah, Ireland that. was great. The conference was awesome. Um, I went. The conference was Gecko, which stands for Genetic Evolutionary Computation Conference, and uh, so it's a bunch of guys who are interested in. Uh, genetic algorithms and neuroevolution, which is my focus, and uh, it's it's basically a way to sort of get computers to you know through trial and error to sort of adapt to their environment. So, you know, in the same way as we adapted as human beings and plants and animals continue to adapt today to their environment, um, you know, we, we want to write computer programs that you know might r- not really know the answer right away, but through adaptation, you know, two parent programs can make a baby program that's a little bit better at solving the task. You should ask and, your parents uh, about that. <laughs> yeah. So the stork brings better and better solutions. It's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. So that sounds pretty nerdy. Were there, uh, was it good conversations and cool people to hang out with? Yeah, definitely. I want to plug one thing, which, uh, so I made an algorithm as part of my PhD dissertation called Hyperneat. And, uh, like a neat freak algorithm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It cleans your floor. No, it's a Roomba. Oh. No, so <laughs> what? It stands for hyper cube neuroevolution of augmenting topologies. But that's neither here nor there. The important thing is, it um, someone took this algorithm and used it to generate a 3D model maker. And uh, he actually had a bunch of these 3D models that he created with a 3D printer. Um. And you can actually go on this website and evolve your own 3D models. And I thought this was really interesting and super fun. Let me see if I can find the link here. Um, ta-da, ta-da. I know it was on my Google Buzz. Oh, here it is. So yeah, the link is www.endlessforms.com. That's all one word, um, endlessforms. Dot com. So we'll, um, you know, put a link in the blog and all that good stuff. But yeah, you can go on there and you can actually take two parent, uh, you know, objects and make baby objects and do mutation and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, grow your own sort of crazy object. And then you can even, for a small fee, have them print it and mail it to you, which I think was really interesting. Um, and they also yeah, found a bunch cool. of bugs in my code and stuff, which is kind of <laughs> useful. So, although, I don't know how useful it is now, but... At any rate, uh, yeah, the conference was great. Um, it was fascinating to talk to some of the people there. And it was also very interesting to go around Ireland. As many people know, Ireland's been the source of strife between, you know, Protestants and Catholics. And uh, one of the things that, you know, we, my wife and I did was take a bus tour through uh, Northern Ireland. And we saw a lot of the places where the conflicts happened. And actually, as, as recently as 1997, uh, the area was a militarized zone, and there were many places like you know cathedrals and even whole cities that civilians weren't really meant to weren't you know outside tourists weren't really meant to visit and weren't supposed to visit. And around 1997, they opened everything up and demilitarized Northern Ireland. And so uh, it was fascinating to see um, you know there's a, a lot of culture there, 
and uh, it, was, it was very interesting. This one's pretty good. Had you been there before? Uh, no, this is the first first time for me. So uh, awesome. Yeah, the bus tour really kind of kind of made it happen um, because otherwise, you know, even though we speak the language and everything, it's Europe is just vastly different, you know. So yeah, um, they drive on the left side of the road and all those things. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely wouldn't have been comfortable driving myself from southern to northern Ireland. <laughs> Well, not nearly as cool as going to Ireland, but I saw uh, the Humble Indie Bundle number three is out yep. now. And uh, so I, I guess this is a group of independent game publishers. Oh, I guess it's a, a group of people who work with independent game publishers to get some games together. And it's almost always cross-platform, so it works on OS X, Linux, and Windows. And yep. they uh, bundle them together and sell them in a pay-what-you-want style of sell so you can pay you know I, I assume as little as a penny i don't know if what the exact minimum is um all the way up to you know some people pay thousands of dollars for the bundle um and then you can the one one really cool thing about it is well there's lots of really cool things but one of them is that you have little sliders and you can set how much of what you pay goes to the developers of the game the developers of the package like the people putting it all together and hosting the website and that stuff uh, and then you, they have two charities that they support, um, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, or Freedom, sorry, <laughs> I messed that up, <laughs> and uh, then the Child's Play. Um, so I know you, you're a big Electronic Frontier Foundation supporter, right? Yeah, definitely. So the Humble Indie Bundle is great. Um, you know, I do it every year, and uh, you know, I, I put a lot of the slider towards the EFF just because it's something that I strongly believe in. But you can, you can really, as Patrick's mentioned, you know, put it, set the sliders and the proportions of your donation however you want. Uh, but they're usually pretty quality games, uh, especially considering you can name your price. They're definitely high quality games for the value, and um, they uh, they distribute them through Steam, which is really useful. So you don't have to deal with you know, as long as you're a Steam member, you don't have to deal with downloading the XE and going through the install shield and making sure it's on all your computers and things like that. And uh, I think the last few times they've even open sourced the games. So um, yeah, you also... I think some of them have been open sourced. Yeah, I don't think so they've you... open sourced all of them. Yep. So you can get look at the source code, which is kind of cool. And one thing that they all have in common is they don't use any DRM, mm -hmm. so no digital rights management. So what that means is that you know, you you actually own the thing that you bought. You know, no one can take it from you. So, yeah. And Child's Play, um, just if, if people don't know what that is, uh, is a charity where they try to install, you know, game consoles or video games of various sorts to hospitals for um, people who are, you know, kind of in the hospital for extended periods of time to have something to do um, and, yep. and to kind of help them with that. So. Yeah, the games for this year are uh, Crayon Physics Deluxe, which is an awesome, awesome game. It's one of my favorite games. I actually already own it, but I, I think I'll, you know, I'll almost definitely buy it and and play the whole thing again. And uh, just to put it simply, you um, you know, you could think of it as being a child, and you draw these uh, objects on on a piece of paper with your crayon, but they come to life. So if you draw, say, a circle that circle turns into a boulder and it falls down to the bottom of the page and starts rolling. And uh, you can create all sorts of different objects and they act as, you know, boulders, cantilevers, uh, you know, you can make a car, you know, you can do all sorts of crazy things. Yeah, I, it's kind of similar to like Scribble Knots meets The Incredible Machine. Yeah, yeah, it's got a lot of both of those. But with drawing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, Cogs I've never played. Have you ever played that one? No, but it looked like it's a kind of 3d slider puzzle where you slide different tiles on various surfaces to align a set of cogs to enable a machine to run it looked pretty interesting oh nice yeah v to the fifth is a v v v v v v v v v v is a platformer oh, is game v to the six uh... right oh you're right i miscounted oh yeah. no now we insulted them oh man this is the first time we've been wrong on the podcast the... yeah only time um, so, the, the um, Vita the Fifth is a platformer game that's sixth. known for being so the sixth for being especially difficult and challenging. And so, um, you know, the thing about platformers is you can uh, you can start like usually there's many levels, and when you die, you just go back to that level, so you don't lose a lot from dying. But they make it very difficult, so you're constantly pushing yourself to like you know get that one more level. 
So I've heard a lot of good things about yeah, it. I right. don't know the other two. Do you know the other two? No, but I know on that Vita the Six, the guy who made Minecraft uh, actually made one of the levels for it. Oh, Notch. interesting. Yeah, so um, he he designed one of the levels, and it looks it looks kind of hard. It looks like one of those ones that uh, kind of punishes your brain a little. Yep. A hammer yep. hammer fight is some. It's like a steampunk helicopter with medieval weapons. You like fly around and destroy stuff. Oh, that sounds uh, awesome. And then, and yet it moves. Uh, at looking at the you know little demo video, it, it looked like you kind of move through a world, and you can kind of rotate the world around you. So your yeah. guy always stays straight up, but the world rotates around you to allow you to move through passages and stuff. Yeah, I've actually played this one. Yeah, so basically, you know, as most platformers, you know, you jump and you sort of navigate through the world. And in this case, it's sort of a little backwards where you're making the world move through you. And uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah, so check that out, uh, especially if you're a gamer or uh, you know want to support a good cause or, yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think uh, you have the Linux kernel 3.0 is out, which is which is really yeah. awesome for uh, for geeks like us who uh, are it's constantly been at two, on the bleeding edge. Two for like a long time. Two yeah. dot stuff. Yeah, I mean it was. I think like uh, if I remember correctly, the way it works is every even number is stable. And every odd number is like experimental. So like 2.5 and 2.3 and 2.1 were all sort of these experimental that, you know, as long as you were running, uh, if you were running, a, a, you know, uh, operating system like Ubuntu or Gen 2 or something like that, you never got those versions. But all the even numbers like 2.6, 2.4 were, were the ones that went out to production. And so to go to 3, just, you know, a lot of people thought that it might even go to 2.10. So to go to 3 is pretty wild. Yeah, so I'm looking here at a little... Gra- it looks like 2.0 was released in 1996. Wow, that dates us, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we were in high school. We actually we were using that version. That makes us feel kind of old. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't in high school. <laughs> oh, I'm a little bit younger than you. <laughs> now I feel uh, It's old. okay. Anyways, but yeah, so I guess they said 3... Po- I was looking a little bit into it. Um, I don't run the Bleeding Edge Linux kernel by any means, but... Uh, the it looked like there was some updates to it but they were more kind of relatively going to 3.0 which seems like a big deal um there was only a few minor updates um yeah, and it did, they wanted to get to 3.0 they just you know too many too long had they had been in the two point region and so they were ready to move on to 3.0 and they decided this is as good a time as any yeah that's cool i mean as as the article mentions there's linux con um there's, there's, you know, a bunch of different conventions, and it's, you know, li- being a Linux event developer is a largely social experience because you think about it, you're writing drivers, and you know, often, I mean, of course, there's algorithms involved and things like that, but a lot of the work, a lot of the code base is, you know, drivers for different hardware, and so to to, to implement these drivers, you have to, you know, talk to a lot of people, and. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a social environment. And as the 20th birthday approaches, bumping up to 3.0 is sort of a little, you know, kind of cute gesture. Yeah, generate some buzz and get people excited. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep. So, th- so, so that's big news. Huh? Doesn't happen yeah. very often. Yeah, yeah, that's some great news. But I think we're, we have to sadly end on a more somber note. Yeah, another thing that's been, uh, you know, as long as I can remember since, uh, I don't know if I said this before, but living in Florida... Um, the space shuttle has always been something that, you know, you can always hear the sonic booms when it comes back in to the atmosphere. You know, I've been out to a number of launches, which is there's just really nothing to compare. It's something you can't capture in video or words or describe. And sadly, uh, shuttle programs now at an end. Yeah. I believe they're going to continue doing unmanned space flight. Is that correct? But not through so, NASA. No, no. So, so they are. So, um, NASA is going to continue to do, you know, all the other stuff it's been doing, uh, and there is plans for more manned spaceflight. They just don't have a manned spaceflight replacement now for the shuttle. Oh, I see. So I we'll see. be using to go to the International Space Station and to do any other sort. We'll be using um, rockets from other countries. So mainly the Soyuz capsule from Russia um, to to send people into space, and then in about. The, the numbers constantly change, but in about four to five years, um, you know, they plan to have something that we have that we can send people up. Um, and there's a big push, though, for there to be more private involvement. So uh, private companies instead of so NASA, for those who don't live in the United States, NASA is a government organization. 
Um, and so they're trying to get more private organizations that will send people to space. And then NASA can basically just buy tickets on other, on other like an airline, right? You know, NASA just wants to buy tickets to space uh, to yeah, send people. Yeah, that's hilarious. I wonder what, do you know, do you have any insight into what a private company would do? Like, like would they just basically sell you know, tickets to visit space and come back. Is that the idea? So there's a number of uh, companies doing this, and this is a kind of a highly charged political thing, so I'll try to stay non-political in this discussion. But, okay. um, yeah, so various companies have different motives. Some have the idea of space tourism, uh, which is, you know, send people into suborbit or low orbit or to even, you know, um, there's the idea of having space hotels and sending people to that, right? And then the cheaper you can make it, the more people on earth who have money to be able to do that uh and then oh, then there's other people who say you know only big government sponsored contractors and the government themselves can send satellites and so there's a lot of people who would want to send satellites if they're cheaper um or it would just be better for everybody if they were cheaper so they're trying to be able to send satellites well if you can send a big enough satellite the satellite can just be a you know capsule that has humans in it and so, um, but then you add this all much more important to keep safety in mind and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you know, right. but basically the humans in a capsule become the payload instead of a satellite. And so there's some people who are taking that approach. So basically being cargo ships with the hmm. one day being able to put humans there too. Nice. That sounds cool. So, yeah, but it, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing because we were the, you know, there was only a couple ways to get humans into space right now. And so to see one of those methods go away, it's, it's a little bit sad. Yeah. And I mean, you know, within, well, not within our generation, but, but, you know, there's plenty of people, you know, all the baby boomers who, who are around, uh, you know, remember, you know, in their lifetimes, the Sputnik and the space fever and uh, Carl Sagan, you know, people just really, you know, pushing the envelope on educating people about space and the universe and the cosmos. And, uh, yeah, to go from that to canceling the program is, yeah, it's a little sad. But, uh, mm. you know, now we have new technologies that are sort of fueling our imagination. Yeah, and, uh, the Mars yeah, rovers the, and, you know, yep. seeing the footage of them driving around on a planet so far away, it's, that is really exciting as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so I feel like, I don't feel like we've lost the the fire of innovation. I just feel like it's being diverted to, you know, other things. And yeah, that there's just something thing. cool about watching all those sci-fi and imagining us being one step closer to being able to ride around on spaceships through outer space. Yep. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's just that part of the geek in you kind of gets sad. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you know now that any aliens passing by aren't going to see our interest interstellar or interplanetary vehicles i guess they will just not the manned ones so yeah all right yeah time for so, oh sorry yeah oh no i was gonna say it's time, time for the for tool of the bye week, of the bye week. <laughs> all right you're up first man all right uh my tool of the bye week is free mind and uh i've actually been using this a lot lately because i've had to sort of i've been doing sort of not really a lot of design but i guess I've been trying to really educate myself on a lot of different technologies lately, and um, this really sort of helps to um, let you sort of jot down a bunch of ideas really quickly. Uh, basically, what FreeMind is is a it's a tool for creating a tree of of phrases, and uh, actually, it can even hold you know rich text and paragraphs and what have you. But you know, you have a root node, which might be let's say the root node is. Uh, you know, HTML, and then just there might be different categories of HTML that you want to learn, like you want to study, uh, you know, you want to study different like, uh, like divs and how to write divs, you want to study tables, like different things. So you, so you can have sort of this tree structure with like a root node and then children. And this thing automatically draws the tree and helps to, you know, reposition the tree. Like if one of the areas of the tree gets very large, it'll move all the nodes around. But it's a way to just quickly jot down a bunch of ideas in a medium that um, that allows you to sort of make connections and allows you to think critically. So it's like making an outline, but more freeform. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it's totally cross-platform and open source. So uh, I believe it's written in Java. So you can um, uh, use it on any OS, and you can even you know take your mind map uh, from one computer to another. Can and, you uh, like export it to like a PDF or something if you want to be able to send it to somebody else or? 
Yep, yeah, it actually lets you export it to a number of different formats. One is HTML, ironically, which we'll talk about later. Um, but it'll let you, you know, export it to a website, export it to PDF. Um, it'll let you do many different image formats. And um, it's really slick. It'll even import, um, if you have like an XML file, it can import that and make a mind map out of it, which oh, awesome. can be useful. Awesome. Yeah. So, so my tool is... Uh, I think most people kind of know about this, and I'm on a streak. You're always on the open source stuff, and I, I kind of haven't been doing open source stuff. I'm probably garnering a lot of glares from people in our audience, but that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so so this week I chose my tool as Picasa, which is a photo management and you know kind of editing software from Google. And uh, I've been taking a lot of photos recently, and uh, it is... It, it, you don't realize now how many pictures you really take between having them on mobile phones and a point and shoot and I have a nice SLR camera and you go on vacation, you come back with just, you know, literally hundreds of photos and having them like with weird names and sometimes they get off on dates or something and it just, it, it can be really a mess to track them and sort them and then there's all this, you know, cleanup you need to do because inevitably you can tweak the picture some, some little way and make it better. Um, mm -hmm. And so Picasso has been really good to be able to handle that. I have tried a couple of open source photo management tools and I just never made it through the learning curve of getting used to them. Yeah. Uh, so does Picasso use the cloud or is it all on your computer? So it has support for both. Um, I mainly use it just because I, I don't have that many photos and I don't really share them with people because I've it, it kind of, to me, ends up, I, I'm not a great photographer, so I feel like it's watching somebody's boring vacation video. And so <laughs> I, don't, I don't typically feel compelled to share my pictures with people. Um, but yeah, they have, so mine just uses on my local computer, but they have the ability to store it Picasa online and Picasa web albums, um, oh, which okay. is integrated in the new Google Plus, which you were talking about last time, which I guess now we, we are both both on there. And we have, a couple, we have about 12 people following us on Programming Throwdown, on yeah, Google Plus, definitely. so we should give a shout out for that. Um, but uh, Picasa web albums integrate tightly with that, so you could post from Picasa the computer application and uh, be able to use that in one of your Google Plus posts. Yeah, definitely. We should mention that we uh, we are on Google Plus, and uh, if you do add programming throwdown, make sure to add us too, because sometimes uh, we'll post geeky stuff, uh, you know, from our personal accounts um, that might be interesting. Uh, you know the po but we will use the programming throwdown account to post you know when there are new episodes and things like that so it's definitely very useful yeah i'd be interested in in hearing um if people want us to post kind of news stories as we see them to programming throwdown or whether they just like that to be podcast announcements yeah so. definitely so shoot us some feedback on plus and let us know sort of kind of help dictate the flow of, of uh, information across that. Yeah, because I could see that as being useful. You know, you'll have these people who say news and that'd be kind of cool to hear it from there. But other people might go, no, 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 <laughs> I don't I don't really want more noise. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so, so yeah, let us know. About the Picasso, yep, I mean, Picasso. My, my concern is like, so I have a bunch of photos and I have, a, a, you know, a gallery software that I run on my computer. My concern is like, if there was to be a fire in my apartment and my computer and everything and it burned to the ground, I'd lose, you know, all of my memories. So that like, sounds would really you, sad and drastic. I know it's, it's <laughs> devastating. So oh, I mean, so would good. you, do you have, is there a way in Picasso where you can say, look, you know, I want to put these on the cloud, but I don't really want to share them or anything. I just want to keep them there just in case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can keep them private. Um, and, and oh, for okay. a backup purpose, that's good. And I believe you actually, there's a, you know, they give you so much space for free. And then if you want more space, you know, there's a fee. And I don't think the fee is actually very much, um, but, but that's their arrangement. Uh, but I okay. actually use separate, which I guess we should talk about at some point, backup strategies. But that is important to make sure you're backed up. And a lot of times people back up to external hard drives and that's good. But if something happens to your house, flood, you're moving, whatever, and they lose the hard drive, then what? Um, yep. So that's kind of better than nothing but not still the greatest so um i actually run some other software that i use to back up more than just my pictures but kind of my my music and other stuff to the cloud Oh, really yeah yeah well definitely we should definitely talk so, about that next episode or something yeah and there's a, there's a number of different ways to do that all of them work fairly well so cool all right so we're talking about programming languages html and css on this show and the hope is uh 
you know, this is going to be a two-parter. We're going to start off by talking about HTML and CSS, which is mainly for, you know, making static web pages. And then we'll go on and talk about JavaScript in the next episode for making, you know, dynamic web content. And, uh, yeah, the goal is at the end of these two parts for people to really have a good understanding, you know, when they go to a web page, uh, especially, you know, nowadays with modern websites like, you know, Gmail, for example, where it's constantly, you know, checking for new emails. You know, what's actually happening under the scenes? Yeah, definitely. I mean, some people kind of, you know, I was telling some people that, uh, you know, we were going to be covering HTML and CSS, and then they were like, oh, it's not really a programming language. But, I mean, it, it is really so vital to a lot of what's being done today, and it, it kind of serves, if not a programming language is by some definition. I mean, it does have very close analogies and similarities to programming languages. And I, I, I mean, I don't know if HTML, it doesn't have loops and stuff like that, like you might associate with a normal programming language, but it is something you can write. It's something that's in a way executed by the browser, which we'll talk about in a second. And uh, I mean, all of us use the web. I mean, that's probably how you found this podcast even. So um, yep. It is. It really is important to know the technologies that underlie that. Yeah, I feel like you know, in many cases, people would argue that a programming language is is one that lets you manipulate things. And so, you know, something like PHP or something, which we'll talk about later, would be a programming language that lets you create HTML. And HTML is sort of the you know, output of a programming language. But you know, remember that, and we'll talk about this more later. But basically, HTML is read by you know, the web browser and processed. And there's many instructions there, like go grab this image or, you know, move this table over there. That So in many ways, there's a lot of computation going on. I feel like that can be underestimated. Yeah, and it, and it is so uh, such a fundamental part of, you know, like you, like you indicated, output of PHP. There's, you know, all sorts of, we're talking about second web frameworks that output HTML and CSS. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you kind—it's of, almost an intermediate language. It's the output of a language that gets run on a browser. Yep. So, so, so let's so, talk. Oh, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say. So, I, I mean, it is a markup language. So, what? Where does that come? What, what's a markup language? Yeah. So this is actually an old term from the printing press days, where they would uh, actually use, you know, position rubber stamps. So they would have, they would oh, have. Oh, I think uh, they were metal. But yes, go ahead. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I guess that makes more sense. Um, but they uh, would basically get, you know, they would want these sort of blue-collar laborers to go and position these stamps uh, every day for the printing press to run, you know, newspapers or magazines, etc. And so they created this language to say, you know, to give a very generic way of, of laying things down on the paper. And so when, H when the HTTP protocol was invented very early on, uh, you know, it was clear that they wanted to use it to disseminate information. So they decided that you know, there's already this markup language in place for newspapers and books. So they might as well sort of leverage some of this and create a hypertext, a markup language that can be used over the internet. And so that is what HTML is, hypertext markup language. Nice, nice. So, so you know, we talked a little bit there about the, the HTTP protocol and the web. So it might be good if we walk through kind of the process. You know, this isn't specific to HTML, but it gives us the context for where HTML fits in this uh, pipeline, as it were. Of what happens when you go to your web browser and you type in a site and, you know, how does it HTML get there and get rendered and all that part? Yeah, yeah, that's that's really important. So let's, I guess let's start here. You go to any website, uh, you know, AOL.com, right? And you nice. hit enter. And it, <laughs> and the first thing it does is it, you know, turns AOL.com into an IP address using something called DNS. And we, we'll kind of leave that for another time. Hand waving. Now it, yeah, that's right. It has this number, this address on the internet. And um, <clears throat> it actually opens up a TCP connection TCP stands for Transport Control Protocol, and <clears throat> opens a TCP session, and then makes a HTTP request on that session. So, the request will contain different things like a little header, 
saying, you know, who's making the request, some information about them. Uh, it'll contain some parameters and it'll contain a cookie. So we'll talk about these. Basically, uh, let's say you visit a website and you'll go and make a request with no parameters, like AOL.com. No parameters, I just want to see what, what AOL has to give me. Uh, the server will receive your request. Now, the request is going to go through many layers. The first layer it'll hit on the server side when they've got your request is called a layer of filters. So they might have filters that say, is this person logged into AOL? If they're not, then send them to the login page. Uh, you know, is this person uh, coming from another country? If they are, then redirect them to AOL.de or AOL.cn for China. Um, then it will, after it passes through all these filters, it goes to what's called a servlet, which is a piece of code on the server dedicated to handling a specific client request. So in this case, it'd probably be a front page servlet for AOL, and you would go on there, and it would uh, it would serve you. You know, the servlet would return the front page contents. Maybe there's some news articles, etc., and it would return this as HTML. And when it returned it, it would return, it would uh, give you a response. And the response contains the, you know, the packet, the payload, which is, in this case, you know, an HTML, uh, you know, a block of HTML. And it will contain some header information. So it will tell you the multi-purpose internet mail extensions or MIME type. So in this case, the MIME type would be HTML because they're giving you an HTML page. They could also be giving you other things, which you know, I'll talk about in a second. So the, the header information will also contain a cookie. And the cookie is a way for you and the website to pass information back and forth. And so we'll talk about that also a little bit later. There's actually a lot that goes on, much more than you would think when you hit a yeah. website. So that's because the HTTP... TP is stateless, so it doesn't maintain an inherent state about the connection. Every time you go to a website and say, hey, I want your web page, without the cookie part, it, it would just give you the default web page and would know nothing else. Um, right. Because it doesn't keep like, oh, you came back, you were just here a second ago. Why, here's what you were doing last time. Um, and so all that is pushed onto the client side, which is with the browser versus the server, which is the part hosting the code. And so the client has to maintain any state that's necessary and change how it interacts with the server so the server knows who it is. Yeah, exactly. So, like, two ways to do state. One would be, let's say you're looking at the news now on, on AOL News or something. Um, you, can also, you can pass in what's called a parameter to the website. So you go to AOL, and uh, the, it shows you the first news article, and you want to see the second one. So you click the little arrow that says go to the second news article. What your browser could do is it can go to AOL.com question mark two. And so whenever you see a question mark at the end of a at the end of a URL, at the end of an address, anything after the question mark um, are uh, is a set of parameters. So you could say question mark page equals two. And when that uh, request gets to the server, the server will see you want to go to AOL.com, but it will also see, you know, your this page variable is set to two. And it might, the servlet might intercept that and say, oh, this person wants the second news article and return that. Um, there's another way, there's actually two more ways to send information to the server. The second is through what's called a post. So whenever you have the question mark and the page equal to at the end of the URL, that's called a get request. There's also a post request, which is, uh, I guess you can say a little bit more private. What it does is, it does effectively the same thing as the get request. It sends you, it would send, you know, page equal to over to the server, but it does it behind the scenes, so it doesn't show up in the URL. And so this is important. L let's say uh, you want to... That's like where to... forms, right? It's like if you fill out something on a form and you push submit, in theory yeah. they could use it there. Exactly. Like let's say you have a form where you're supposed to put in your first, last name, and your social, uh, and you hit submit. Well, you don't want it to change the URL to question mark Patrick social equals five 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 whatever, right? What? <laughs> don't share that. How did you so, find that out? Because you don't want like your buddy behind you looking at the URL and knowing your social, right? 
Although, or even just, you know, you leave the computer, all of the URLs you visit are in your history. You don't want your social in your history, your social security number. So, um, so post gives you a little bit more security there. Um, but by far the best security comes from cookies. And what cookies are, are is basically an object that gets passed from you to the server and then also passed back from the server to you. So, you know, the posts and the gets are one way, but the cookies are two way. And so cookies are a way for you to do uh, a bunch of really interesting encryption things with uh, between yourself, the client and the server. So, for example, uh, you know, you don't want to just pass your social security number like Patrick social equals this across the Internet. So what you might do is you might pass a cookie saying, hey, here's a here's a key. Uh, and then the server might pass back another cookie or a third party might pass you another cookie across the internet and say, hey, here's some other key. And using these different keys, you can encrypt your password and then pass that encrypted password as another cookie. So cookies allow you to do a little bit more fancy, uh, uh, you know, message passing back and forth. Um, but yeah, basically... So, so you ultimately get this this HTML description in, in this mime and that... We, we talked about that it's a that it's a markup so it shows here by whatever means you know that's gone on behind the scenes but it finally arrives at your browser and then your browser has to do something with it so it yep. goes through and finds tags right those are the if you ever look at it those are the things in the angle brackets um, mm -hmm. and and says hey this is markup this is telling me to stick this thing here or you know this thing over there um, and so then it goes through and parses that information, reads it, and decides what to do with it. And then just it may also contain, hey, you need to go grab this other thing. Like uh, we'll talk about it in a second, but go grab this CSS, this cascading style sheet from over here, or go grab this image at this URL and then render it and stick it here. Um, and so once it has that, your browser gets the HTML, but then it has to go back to the server possibly and get more information. It might have to make other requests to get images, to get other things that might be there. Exactly. Yeah, so when the server returns that response, it will have that MIME that we talked about. So you might grab the HTML, and the HTML might say, hey, you need a bunch of images. And you might go to the server and say, hey, I need to get this resource, and I'm pretty sure it's an image. So you could tell the server, hey, I want, you know, this resource in the MIME, I think it's an image, and the server will return back and say, yes, the MIME, it's an image, it's a PNG image, or it's a JPEG, and, uh, and here's the payload. In this case, it's not HTML, but it's just a chunk of data that represents a JPEG image, or a cascading style sheet, or many other things. Yeah, so that describes kind of where to stick the data on the page, how to locate it in ways, but it you could make the HTML describe and only have an HTML and have a static, you know, web page with just text and colors and, and, you know, that kind of stuff. But as you try to do more and more, it could get really complicated, very intricate, and, um, you know, kind of have all these layers you're trying to do to get something exactly where you want it on the page in a certain color with a certain look and feel and texture. Um, but then when you want to make, you know, news page two, then you gotta recreate all that HTML code. And so cascading style sheets are a way to take away the data, the text, the paragraphs, the images as it were, that the HTML represent, and the way those get rendered, kind of maybe where they go on the page, or the background color, or if you have like curvy edges on your tables or, or whatever, and put that in a separate document that separates how what the data is from how it gets presented or displayed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, let's say you had 100 web pages, 100 HTML pages that you were serving to people, and you wanted to change the font on all 100 of them. Well, that would be brutal because you know, you'd have to change it on all of them. You'd have to make sure you know, it looked right, and you'd have to push it out, uh, push 100 files out to the server so that they could be read by users. If you have a CSS, a cascading style sheet, you can just make the change once in that style sheet. And all the HTML files will just say, hey, use this style sheet over here. And you know, any any ta any uh, text um, you know 
the font's going to be whatever this style sheet you know says it is. Yeah, so they all reference the same style. Sh- this wow, <laughs> the same style sheet. Too many S's in a row. <laughs> um, the other thing, so so the cascading part. So the style sheet makes sense, and and then the cascading comes in because you can get what what amounts to inheritance between the style sheet. So like you know a master definition of of some you know high level things for your site, but then maybe you're in the forum section of your site. So you could have a separate CSS that's for the forum section of the site, which gives more specifics, details that are only used there that aren't used somewhere else. Right. Like, as Patrick mentioned, there's HTML is made up of a bunch of tags. Like, you might have a tag that says, here's an image. You might have a tag that says, here's a paragraph. Another tag might say, here's a table or here's a heading. And each tag has two things. It can have up to two things. It can have a style and it can have an ID, and they're both strings. So you can have a table, and the style is dark, and the ID is, uh, you know, news table. So you can only have, the ID is meant to be unique. So if, if one table is called news table, the other one has to be called something else, like like footer news table, table or something. Oh. Yeah, news <laughs> table too. But you could have 10 things all with the style, you know, dark, right? And so... Where the cascading comes into play is you can say, I want my font, like in general, I want my font to be Helvetica. But if my style is dark, I want my font to be Arial Black. And if my style is dark and my ID is news, then I want my font to be Arial Black and bolded. So that's where the cascading comes into effect. It'll try and pick the most specific style, but, uh, you know, so it'll try and find a style for your specific ID. But if one doesn't exist, it'll take a step back and try and find a style for your style uh, tag (laughs) (laughs) attribute. And if it doesn't find that, it'll take another step back and say, okay, what's just the default font for all paragraphs? And it'll use that. If if it doesn't have anything there, the web browser has its own default um, style sheet that it applies. Yeah, and and that helps, like, you know, like Jason was indicating, you know, if you've got to put that file in one place then you have all these specifics laid out and you can have multiple style sheets and you only have to go change those you don't have to go change every single web page that you have which may be many 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 web pages or in the case of if it's generated from a web framework then uh you just have to worry about rendering the data and the css handles the style um and then you don't have to go and make sure your code knows how to output the formatting as much right yeah yeah, I mean, imagine an environment where you know, you have a couple of web pages that are static and they're just .html files, but you also have some pages that are generated, um, you know, based on certain content. I mean, maybe you're scanning the weather and you're giving someone a map, but the map's generated based on the weather in the area and it's different every time. You know, that code that does the generation and the static HTML code are usually in two different places. But you want to make sure that it all looks the same. You don't want that code just because it's done dynamically. You don't want it to look ugly. So the style, the cascading style sheets allow you to apply the same style to everything, regardless of where it came from. Another really useful feature is that if you've ever been to a website that allows you to choose a theme, um, that can be handled by choosing what CSS is loaded. Yep. So you can have a CSS that's the light blue theme or one that's the happy kitten theme um, and that that changes what CSS your browser uses uh, if you want um, and this is can be kind of interesting uh, it's like if you download an HTML page you could change what CSS it uses and change how it looks or you know in theory right you could have some some part of your browser that overrides the H, the CSS referenced by an HTML and point it to something different and change how uh, you know websites you use every day look and feel by writing your own CSS for it. Yep. Yeah, there's a plugin. You know, most browsers will have a plugin where you it will go through and replace the CSS links with links to CSS files on your computer. And that's mainly for development. So you could go right now to, you know, to keep using the same example to AOL.com, but but have it use your CSS files that are on your computer somewhere. And you know, people from AOL would do something like this to sort of change the look and feel and do nice cutesy design, um, make cutesy design decisions 
uh, without you know breaking the website or without um, you know having to push something out to the users. They can just test it on their own machine. Yeah, I've actually seen a couple websites where they've asked for user feedback for people to change CSS or the style of the website. So use what they have for the default thing, and then users can submit new look and feel for the website. And this is one of the ways that they could do that. Oh, interesting. That's, that's kind of cool, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If you've got a really involved community, because it can be a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I noticed there's some frameworks that do that. And so that's kind of nice because you get it for free if you're using those frameworks. Yeah. Or those, I guess, CMSs, content management systems. Right, right, right. Um, so uh, uh, something recently that that's you might hear about is uh, HTML has version numbers. So most of the web nowadays uses HTML4, um, but you hear about this HTML5. What, what are some Ooh. of the changes coming up in HTML? We talked earlier about Linux 3. HTML must be better because it's at five. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll post a link on the on the blog that we'll have. Um, it's actually called HTML5Rocks.com, and uh, it has some cool slides and some nice slick interface for showing you some of the new features. But but in a nutshell, um, you know, HTML works hand in hand with JavaScript, which we'll talk about on the next show. But um, what HTML5 adds is a bunch of uh, sort of dynamic tags that add very rich content. So for example, um, there's a canvas tag. So you can say, you know, canvas tag, and then in there you can say box, or you could say triangle, or you can say whatever, and you can it'll just draw these shapes like right onto the website. Um, so, you know, in the past you uh, had to do sort of really crazy stuff, or use Flash, or use Java applets, or use you know, all sorts of different hacks, ActiveX controls to get, you know, rich content on the internet. And HTML5 is a attempt by, you know, a consortium of companies to say, you know, look, we don't need all these third party applications that are really kind of hacked together and don't work on every browser. And what we really need is to just make HTML better and to, right. to make it dynamic and to make it, uh, uh, you know, more interactive. Yeah, and add things like the ability to embed movies directly and yep. even have some ability to have offline storage for your website so that you can do kind of offline use of the website. For things like, uh, you know, if you have a mail client, you might want to be able to browse your Hotmail um, when, even when you're not connected to the Internet. You won't be able to get new stuff, but at least you could browse what you already have. Yep, that's right. And so HTML has that. But with great change comes great controversy. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. Uh, it's not completely settled exactly what HTML5 will end up being when it's all said and done. Yeah, one of the biggest controversies in HTML5 right now is the video encoding. Um, you know, right now, uh, there's sort of a patent war going on, as many of you know, in Silicon Valley between many different companies and consortia. And uh, basically, where it stands right now with, with the video encoding in HTML5 is... You know, the Internet Explorer and Safari, so Apple's browser and uh, and and uh, Microsoft's. Microsoft's browser, they support MPEG-4, but uh, MPEG-4 is um, covered under a patent. So they pay a license fee to, I th believe, Frank Hauser, uh, which is a company, uh, I believe, located based out of Germany. But So they pay Frank Hauser um, LLC, you know, to use the MPEG-4 codec. And you know patents are really hairy business. Technically, uh, they're breaking the patent, but they have an agreement, so on and so forth. It's all kind of shady. So you know Firefox, being being you know an open platform and and you know being largely funded by the EFF, which we talked about, and the Free Software Foundation, which are vehemently against patents, said we're not going to do MPEG-4. This doesn't work. You know this is, we're not happy with this. So they decided they're going to support um, Og Theora. And another codec called the VP8 codec, which is a codec developed at Google, which is completely open source with no patent restrictions. Um, Chrome, Google Chrome, which is another browser, has jumped on the bandwagon and supports the same, uh, you know, video codecs that Firefox supports. And so, what you end up with is, if you're on IE, you know, your HTML5 videos won't work if the server expects you to be on Firefox and vice versa. And so, you know, these kind of things always happen with new technology. There's always these battles. 
Um, but, you know, eventually things will start to stabilize. Yeah. Yeah, um, so that's my, that's my soapbox for the day. <laughs> <laughs> so there are some variants of HTML. So we got XHTML. Yeah, so these um, these are very pedantic. I mean, this isn't the kind of thing that revolutionizes the web as much as people at the time would like uh, venture capitalists to believe. Uh, XHTML is just a stricter formatting for HTML. So, for example, um, in regular HTML, uh, well, let's explain a little bit how tags work. Okay. Uh, in HTML, you have an opening tag and a closing tag. So you might say opening tag table and then have opening tag row and then have opening tag cell. So a table is made up of rows, which are made up of cells. Then you might have put in some cell data. They might say closing tag cell. You know, that's the end of that one cell. Then close, to, you know, put some more cells, open, open a cell, close a cell, open a cell, close a cell. Then you'll close a row. You can make some more rows, and in the end, you'll close the table, and that's the end of that table. Um, some of the tags in regular HTML don't have to be closed, although they really should be. So, for example, you can have a paragraph where you open the paragraph and you just don't close it. Uh, you know, you just have a paragraph open tag, you type some text, and then you have a table open tag. And browsers had to get really smart about knowing, oh, this paragraph closed because this, this person started a table and the table is clearly not part of that paragraph. Uh, but this got very tricky in browsers. You know, you'd go from one browser to the other and your page wouldn't work right. So they decided to make HTML more strict. And most web pages made nowadays um, are written in XHTML, which adds some extra restrictions. So if you open a tag, you have to close it. Um, and there's a couple other restrictions, but that's the biggest one. Uh, another uh, buzzword is DHTML, and uh, this is this basically just means using JavaScript and HTML at the same time. This is kind of a buzzword that's used that generated a lot of hype, but but it doesn't really mean anything. So don't confuse these two things with HTML5. HTML5 is huge um, and revolutionary, and these two things really they're not much of anything. So uh, so definitely be excited for HTML5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of interesting things still coming up as far as like adding animation support directly to HTML5 without using, you know, JavaScript or Flash and getting rid of yep. more plugins to help support cross-browser compatibility. It, hopefully it will be good, but until we get there, we don't know. Yep, that's right. If you do want to use the latest HTML5 features, um, I believe the development version of Firefox and the um, current version of Chrome uh, support just about everything. Uh, there's a few things with the audio API that aren't supported with the regular version of Chrome. You have to go on the dev version. Um, but if you use e either of these two browsers, um, even the, the you know public versions, um, you'll see a lot of what HTML5 has to offer. Yeah. So besides just web pages, um, which is what prior to a year or two ago, most everything when you talked about HTML was talking about a web page uh, or I guess a, a few other niche uses. Um, but now more and more people are using HTML to do things not just in a browser on a website in the traditional sense. Uh, we talked previously about um, on iOS that you could have a web page show up as like an icon on your what amounts to your desktop. Um, and, you know, when you click it, it, it launches and it can even launch basically a web app, a web application um, with a browser that you don't see. So you just see the app. It just runs just like a program, but it's really uh, embedded browser rendering HTML content for the user. So think of this again to use like Hotmail. You could have Hotmail as essentially an HTML that lives on the phone and some JavaScript that when you run it displays what's local to the phone, but then has a component which can go out and grab new mail, bring that in and display that. And if it's written well enough and supports what's needed to do that, you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference between that and a program written in Objective-C for the iPhone. Yeah, I mean, you know, just take a moment if you're if you're looking at a web browser right now while you're watching this podcast, or you can visualize one. As long as you're not driving, we don't want you to get an accident. Yeah, don't close your eyes. Yeah, um, just imagine the address bar not being there, 
and and the tabs not being there and just you just looking at the one page you're looking at and it's taking up the whole screen there's really not much standing in between that you know differentiating that from just a regular application uh, the nice thing is you know you can make an application that works in a browser but then also works without a browser at the same time and uh, this is really uh, you know for things which are largely static this is um, you know a great way to go because you get so much for free you know the people who wrote the browsers kind of did the heavy lifting for you yeah it's like using a really big framework or SDK or something yeah yeah exactly yeah, it is nice, and it really helps that if you want to run on both, you know, iPhone and Android, you yep. have a lot less work to do because now you don't have to write it in Java and Objective C. Yeah, exactly. There's a web, there's a application called PhoneGap, which what this does is it takes a website that you've created, and it will deploy it on all sorts of different environments on uh, Android, iOS. I think it even does Windows Mobile, and it even does. Uh, like some of the more obscure ones like Palm uh, and things like that. But basically, it'll just, you know, take the HTML and JavaScript that you've written and do some reinterpretation as necessary to get it to be compatible with the browser um, on the phone and uh, just make it an app on the phone. So, you know, you can write something once, you can test it on your computer using, you know, your web browser, and then using this phone gap, you just, you can deploy it and be 99% sure it's going to work on you know every smartphone out there, which is which is really powerful. We already kind of talked about before, but uh, to kind of emphasize again, uh, although you can write hand hand by hand write HTML, a lot of HTML that you see on the web is generated from other programs written in other languages. Um, some of the popular ones, you know, being like PHP, Ruby on Rails. A number of Python web frameworks. Uh, some websites actually have a C++ backend or even a C backend, which uh, once the browser communicates with it, responds with an HTML page. This really flexibility of HTML that allows all of that to happen. And so it, it is used as a, a method of communicating what needs to be displayed. Uh, and it doesn't just have to be the traditional old school static HTML site that a person wrote by hand. Yeah, that's right. I mean, imagine if you have, uh, you know, you're writing some kind of inventory system and you have some database somewhere where every time someone buys one item, it, you know, reduces that inventory by one. And so then when it gets to zero, it pops up, you know, it might show up in red or something like that. So yeah, you might write something in Python, which says, hey, you know, go to this database, get all the records. And for each record, convert the record into a block of HTML. So, you know, make a paragraph tag and make a little font tag for the ones that are empty and things like that. And just turn this database data into HTML code on the fly. And so if the person hits refresh on the page, you know, after some people have gone through and bought some things, they'll see the new value, like the new inventory. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of a big strength, and I, I don't know how how much people anticipated. They, they design a lot of flexibility in HTML, um, but it really has survived. I mean, we haven't gone through any other real ways. I mean, there, there were early on, but for a long time, we've been on HTML, and that be the kind of the language of the web. Uh, and so the basic HTML has very widespread support. Um, as long as if you don't do anything weird or funny, um, it's really well supported. It's when you get into adding plugins or JavaScript or other things that you can run into cross-platform issues. But HTML itself is very cross-platform compliant. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, so I guess we'll we'll cover the strengths briefly. Um, you know, as Patrick mentioned, it's very cross-platform. So you write the website once, and 99% of it will work. Um, you know, on everyone's computer. And typically when you're making websites, you're making them for a lot of people. I mean, you might, I mean, imagine how many people visit, I don't know, AOL or visit any of these really popular websites, Yelp, right? I, I mean, can't has cheeseburger. I can't has cheeseburger. Google Plus, right? I mean, there's millions of people going on these websites and they come from, uh, their computers come from all sorts of backgrounds. Some people are running Linux, some people are 
some people are running Linux kernel 3.0 beta uh, <laughs> with the latest Chrome on them. Some people are running really old uh, Windows 98 machines with IE6 or something, right? And so the web has to work for all of these people. Um, actually, it doesn't have to work for IE6 anymore. <laughs> but the web, has, <laughs> the web has to work for a lot of these people. And so, and, and the way HTML is designed, it, it does, it accomplishes this. And uh, so, one of the hardest things in, in, you know, software development is deployment. You know, is getting your application to run on everyone's machine. Anyone who's worked for a company or done commercial software development knows that there's a, there's a percentage of people that you just know up front that you're going to have to refund them their money because the game you made isn't going to work. Or you know the app you wrote it just crashes every time. Uh, you know, this is just a known fact when you're writing you know desktop apps and things like that. That you're just gonna have there's gonna be unsatisfied customers. Uh, when you're using HTML, um, you know the number of people who actually get your content correctly is is amazing when you really think about it. All the different machines that are coming to your site. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, the other thing is it, it's hand writable so. You know this. Uh, you know uh, we've talked about using you know programs to generate HTML, but you know especially for some of the static things, like you might have an idea in your head of sort of how the web page should flow, and it's sort of a it's it's a design, it's an aesthetic, um, you know, exercise in making a website, and so making something that's hand writable where you can go in and tweak some values, and maybe you want the heading bar to be a little bit smaller to give you some more real estate. Um, you can go in and do that. You don't have to uh, mess with some program or something to get at the HTML. You know, typically, especially with cascading style sheets, uh, you can go in and tweak all the values and make your website look just right. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so some of the issues, I guess, are that HTML, plain old vanilla HTML4, doesn't really allow... We, we keep talking about static web pages, but HTML and CSS together don't really provide a way for animations or interactivity of any significant meaning uh, right. by themselves. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we'll talk more in the next episode about JavaScript and Ajax and things like that. But, but yeah, I mean, regular HTML and CSS, if you want to see something different, you have to hit F5, you know, <laughs> you have to hit the, or Control-R if you're on Linux. You have to hit the refresh button on your browser to get, to get new content. Yeah. Um, there's also the way it's implemented now, and I know there's some movement afoot to try to fix this or change this in, in a number of different ways, but when you we talked about you go request the HTML site, right? So whatever, AOL.com, and it responds with AOL.com slash index.html, and you get that, and your browser starts parsing it, and it says, oh, I need to go get this CSS sheet. It doesn't maintain that connection. It opens a TCP connection, gets to HTML, and then closes the TCP connection. So that's like a phone call. Picks up the phone, dials, says, hey, I want the HTTP thing here, grabs it, hangs up. Then it goes, oh, I need the CSS sheet. Picks up the phone, dials the number, you know, asks, hey, I need the CSS sheet. What server sends it across? Then it hangs up. And while it's doing that, the browser can optimize a little by making all of those requests in parallel but still each item is a separate TCP session. And just like in that analogy of picking up the phone, there's an overhead of picking it up and dialing a number. And the same is true in TCP, that to be flexible, TCP has like a little bit of a you know slower startup time than you might want if you're gonna be making many, 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 many requests to the same server. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just to put things in perspective, you know, video games and things which have a high you know real-time component to them are done in UDP so because UDP is another protocol which we won't really get into but because TCP has too much overhead um, so they have to use UDP so this H, you know HTML is going over HTTP which has even more overhead than TCP which isn't good for a lot of applications so you, HTTP really isn't good for a lot of applications and this is the biggest weaknesses and then you know again there are as Patrick mentioned there's um, I think it's called speedy SPDI which is a HTTP replacement that Google Chrome has uh, built into it um, and there's you know other you know web sockets and things like that 
which are trying to sort of alleviate this problem. But you know, for 99% of the web developers out there, um, this is you know uh, this is a major weakness of using HTML. Yeah, and so the way the user would see that though is it's going to be latency. So the time you hit enter to the time they can browse your web page. And you want that to be as short as possible because if it's too long, and we all remember the days when the transfer speed, you know, just the bandwidth to transfer all the images and text took a long time. Now, we, I won't say we've completely gotten past that, but now we're running into other bottlenecks which are becoming meaningful portions of the time to load a web page like these things. Yeah, and I mean, even just if it's not, you know, uh, you know many seconds like it was back then when we had modems, uh, we still have this issue where because you know each thing is a different request you might go to a site and it might have let's say 30 images in it but they all load at different times and so there's like a second or so where you're just getting all this weird like things shifting around and your browser is just yeah you know as it gets all the images it just sort of does something crazy you know and again there's ways around this but you know by default html and css uh this is you know a big weakness once you start adding layers to to fix some of these weaknesses, like add interactivity and um, you know try to add animations, those kind of things, you start to run into the fact that although it was a strength that HTML is cross-platform, you also have the fact that people are running browsers that are 10 years old and yep. you know eight years old. And I saw a really good graph about this once for each of the major. Uh, each of the major web browsers, how many people are still using old versions, but uh, corporations don't necessarily want to roll out the latest and greatest thing because they, it's an unknown. You've got you know your grandmother who doesn't know how to update her Internet Explorer, and so if Windows doesn't tell her to do it, she's not going to do it. And so you've got people using really old browsers which may have bugs or problems, and so you can get, as you build up complexity, you get all these weird rendering issues uh, and you have to check compatibility across, you know, more than just four or five, you know, probably 10 or 15 different browser and browser version numbers to really, if you want to make sure you get all of your users the same experience. Yeah, so it's not uncommon for a web developer to use VirtualBox, which I think we talked about VirtualBox as one of the tools yeah, of yeah, the yeah. bye week. Yeah, so it's not uncommon to have VirtualBox with you know a Windows XP machine with IE6, a Windows XP machine with IE7, Windows XP machine with IE8, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and to have all of these virtual computers all with different virtual browsers, and um, and to try your website on all of them and see what the you know what happens. It's not uncommon, actually. It's almost guaranteed that you'll write a website. Uh, with uh, you know, with Chrome or with Firefox or with Internet Explorer in mind, and then you will go to one of the other browsers and it won't look right. I mean, something will look different. Maybe the text is just big enough where it causes everything to sort of collapse um, further down in the page, and you'll have to go in and make tweaks. You have to say, you know, in your CSS, you have to say, if this is IE8, do this, um, or in your HTML, you'll have to write some JavaScript that says, you know. If this is, uh, you know, Chrome, you have to make this setting. Otherwise, make that setting. Yeah. Uh, there are some tools out there to help with those kinds of things. Like, I know there's some services cropping up to have a bunch of basically, like you said, virtual box instances where they run your website and then send you pictures of all of the results. Or at oh, least pictures, interesting. pictures of the ones that they've detected to have rendered differently. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I've never heard of that, but that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, there's some people trying to do that. It's very cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's genius. Because that way they just have the virtual boxes up all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just, as soon as you give them a website, they go and visit it. So it's really cool. Um, yeah, I guess the only other weakness I can think of is um, just the verbosity, right, of HTML. So, yeah. you know, when the HTTP protocol does have compression um, standards built in, so it will automatically compress your HTTP content um, before it sends it over the wire. So you don't have to worry about doing that. But even as in compressed form, you know, it's it's a description of what the web page should look like. And so the tags are very verbose. And, um, you know, you're having a lot of these opening and closing tags all over the place. So you might want to just, you know, have a little table with some text in each of the cells 
Uh, and you might, if you're writing it in C or something like that, you might just say, look, at this position, put this text, at this position, put that text. But because you're writing it in HTML and it has to sort of conform to all these browsers and it has to look nice on all these different computers, you have to be sort of very generic and say, I want this table and I want this row and column and ends up becoming very verbose. Yeah, and uh, not only in you know data overhead of sending all that redundant information across, but trying to fix a problem and go through you know, all of these tags and parameters and, and stuff to try to find where the problem might be can be a little overwhelming. If you're yeah. trying to debug like a static HTML page by hand or trying to debug the output of uh, you know, a machine generated HTML page. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people say that the, uh, you know, the modern internet was built on the back of Firebug, which is um, a extension, or maybe it's built into Firefox. I think um, it's a I think it's a plugin. Oh, okay, still an extension. Yeah, but uh, they, uh, you know, what it does is it will actually, you can click on something while you have this firebug running, and it will sort of show you what the HTML is. Because you might have a program, as we mentioned, generating HTML on the fly. And let's say you had a bug in that program. You, your output is just going to be a bunch of HTML. So you might end up with garbage HTML, or you might end up with lines being colored red, even though they shouldn't be. And this firebug lets you sort of go inside and say, what does this HTML look like at this particular spot? So uh, I think Chrome has something similar called uh, Inspector, which is built into Chrome. You can just right click and say Inspect Elements. And you can do this right now even if you're using Chrome. And it'll sort of show you the HTML that was generated for that particular element. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, so HTML, CSS, I mean, the technology started a long time ago, but it's still very applicable to today. It's still used. It's the language of the web. And very. It's it's although maybe not directly a programming language, certainly it'll be valuable experience for our listeners to learn some more about it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that the Internet is really, you know, they always say, I, I think uh, Larry Page is quoted as saying, never bet against the Internet. And uh, you know, what he's insinuating is that the the Internet is really, uh, because of the way it's just so distributed in nature and the way you can broadcast content out to hundreds or thousands or millions or billions of people, um, it's really a just an amazing medium for getting information out there. And uh, so this is HTML and CSS are the, are your paint and paint, uh, are your paintbrushes and pencils that you use to sort of create in this medium? So uh, this is the first of two, um, you know, podcasts on this topic. Uh, in the next show, we'll talk about JavaScript, which is a way to sort of add dynamic content and make your page change on the fly. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is definitely where it all started, and this isn't going away. So you said next episode. Next episode is going to be episode number ten. That's right. It's a milestone. The double digits. Pretty awesome. Yeah, it's been enjoyable so far. Um, you know, I typically wrap up the show talking about how things are going. So, um, like we said, we've gotten some people following us on Google Plus. That's been really nice and encouraging and awesome. Hopefully, we can get a dialogue going there. As yep. always, make sure you can visit the blog for show notes and uh, you know, able to download the podcast there as well. And that's programmingthrowdown.blogspot.com. You can also email us at programmingthrowdown at gmail.com. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you have any, you know, questions or, uh, you know, uh, you know, feedback on the podcast, or if you if you have any programming questions, you know, let's say you want to know about something particular like, uh, like game design, or you want to know about, you know, uh, data structures, I don't know, anything uh, that kind of like piques your curiosity and you want us to sort of elucidate. Um, more information <laughs> on that is not a problem so uh, yeah we're we're uh, we're definitely you know there's no shortage of programming languages as I'm sure you guys know out there by now um, but uh, if there's a particular one that you're interested in that we haven't covered yet definitely shoot us an email and let us know yeah well if that's it I, uh, I guess we'll wrap it up thank you all for listening yeah have a good week the intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. 
You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.